Good afternoon, everybody. Well, welcome to another edition of a webinar from Libby Hospital. This afternoon, we'll be talking about myocardial infarction, or what we popularly understand as a heart attack. And um, though you are seeing me here sitting alone, but Dr. Edapri will be joining us very soon to discuss uh, this topic is already online. Dr. Edafi, can you please yeah. our participants? Ah, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's interesting topic, uh, diagnosis and treatment of uh, heart attack. Very interesting topic, and uh, I pray God will have a very fruitful deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. So we already have about 77 participants and uh, we hope that more people will join us as we start so that we don't delay the people that are already here and so that we don't take much of our time and yes. like i mentioned we'll be we'll be discussing at attack that is also known as myocardial infarction that is what we'll be talking about today and like i said we're coming to you from cardio care specialty hospital um, we are a cardiology center and also takes care of all the uh, subspecialty in internal medicine, endocrinology, neurology, uh, pulmonology, nephrology. And uh, this is one of the topics we discuss in, we have in the series of uh, uh, educational topics that we've been handling. So like I said, today we'll be talking about heart attack or myocardial infarction. I'll be going through this outline and I will start with a case presentation. One of our patients that we saw uh, recently, so he's a 41 year old man that was referred on account of chest pain. The pain started three days before he got to us. It was central in location with assisted di diaphoresis. He had no fever, there was no pleuritic chest pain. There is background history of hypertension, but he has not been on any treatment for this. Two weeks before presentation, he was also found to have elevated blood sugar, and treatment has not been was not commenced as at the time we saw him. There was family history of hypertension. He neither smoked nor takes uh, alcohol, and on examination, he was in distress. He had cold extremities. He was not pale. Uh, there was tachycardia. The heart rate was 127 beats per minute. The blood pressure was 120 over 90 millimeter of mercury. Uh, first and second accent only uh, was picked, and there was no no murmur. There was also tachypnea, and uh, he had vesicular breath sound, and. Um, when he came, we were suspecting possibility of an heart attack, a myocardial infarction. So our working diagnosis when he came in was a uh, myocardial infarction. And then uh, immediately we saw him, he came in emergency. So we first of all gave him 300 milligram tablet of aspirin to chew. And uh, he was commenced on intranasal oxygen and urgent ECG and troponin was ordered. And this was the ECG we got when, when he came in. And the ECG had this uh, ST segment elevation from V1 down to V5. So that was what he got. And when his troponin results, came out, the troponin was severely elevated. It was greater than 2,000. The normal level should be less than 50 nanogram per meal, but his own result was greater than 2,000, and his random blood sugar too was severely elevated. And so he was, he was commenced on treatment. Like I said, he was admitted into the ICU, and he was started on oxygen, aspirin, it was given isosorbide dinitrate, and it was quickly taken into the cat lab where he had coronary angiography. And the angiography showed 
98% stenosis in mid-left anterior descending artery, which was stented and uh, stented successfully, and uh, it was continued on antihypertensive, uh, diabetic medication, uh, medication for diabetes, uh, dua antiplatelet, which is used for about six months before, unfortunately, it developed upper GI bleeding and uh, aspirin was stopped and it continued with clopidogrel and uh, other medication. And this ECG was done at follow-up after some months and we can see some premature ventricular complex showing us one of the complications that patients with myocardial infarction could have. Dr. Edafe, please, what, do you have any comment about this case? Hello, Dr. Edafe. I think Sorry, I did. I, I unmute myself. I unmute myself. Sorry. Okay. So any comments you about the answer? case, sir? Yes. Number one, this is a very young, a young guy, a 41-year-old uh, male. Very interesting. There is no much to really say about his uh, risk factor, but yet he had uh, ST segment elevated myocardial infarction. So these diseases are there with us, and the uh, even though is more common among the elderly people we see them also in the young the other issue here is that may, sometimes you can't even find a risk factor to yes, lay sir. hand on so we should have this very high index of suspicion so that if we see anybody who present with either chest pain epigastric pain we don't just bring it out or pain around the left shoulder around the neck we don't just bring it up and say that uh, there's nothing, rather we should investigate them and send them appropriately. So very interesting case, extremely interesting. Thank you very much. So the, the patient is still on follow-up and is, is, doing, is doing very, very well on his uh, medication. And so quickly, we go to defining what at attack is. And heart attack, like I said, is also known as myocardial infarction. And it occurs when there is obstruction to one or more of the coronary arteries and uh, resulting in reduction in blood flow to the myocardium. It could be ischemia or infarction of the affected area. So the key word is there's disruption of the blood supply to the coronary vessels. And um, this definition is uh, taking into consideration the, uh, the type one and the type one in, in, importantly of the causes or of the type of myocardial infarction. So most of our discussion today will be based on the type one myocardial infarction. That is the one that is due to obstruction because you can also have at attack or myocardial infarction without any obvious or significant obstruction in the coronary arteries. Dr. Edafi, do you have any addition to this uh, definition before we go ahead? Yes, the, as you said, heart attack is when there is an obstruction in the uh, coronary artery. So when we meet the coronary arteries are basically classified as the epicardia and the resistant vessels. Now, the, the heart attack that we actually define here refer to the epicardia obstruction. The epicardia vessels are the conduits just to carry blood into uh, the smaller vessels which, uh, uh, um, which um, uh, network within the myocardium of the heart. So if the problem occur within the myocardium, Sorry, within the uh, resistant vessels that uh, goes with network within the myocardium, that may also be a, a form of a heart attack, but you don't actually do a stenting at that point. So uh, the definition covers the epicardial vessel, that is the conduit vessels that carry blood into 
the resistance vessel. Go ahead. Thank you very, thank you very much, sir. So now going to the universal definition of malaria infection. Before you can actually say someone has malaria infection or heart attack, two important things must be present. Present. The first one is there must be evidence of malaria injury. Then you must also have evidence of acute malcardia ischemia. So to fully break this down, you must have evidence that there is injury to the malcardium due to disruption in the blood supply. And the evidence for this is the presence of cardiac biomarkers, which we will show later in the presentation. Then this must be in the setting of ischemia of the myocardium. And so breaking that down, number one, you must have evidence of myocardial injury, which is shown by either a rise or a fall in troponin level. That's the cardiac biomarker that is used now. And two, there must be evidence of ischemia. And this ischemia is, evidence is defined as one, symptom of ischemia, whether the patient has a chest pain or other atypical features like uh, dyspnea, um, like um, um, nausea or vomiting and other atypical presentation like that. Or you have ECG changes, whether ST segment elevation, ST segment depression, or a new left bundle rat block, or you have development of Q waves, on the ECG, or you are able to do echo and you have world, new world motion abnormality that is compatible with the suspected uh, with the suspected area of infection or the blood vessel identified, or you are able to do an angiography and you are able to identify a significant obstruction. So the two conditions must be present before you say a patient has suffered heart attack. And this table is showing, elaborating on what I've explained. So if you have evidence of myocardial injury, that is a rise or fall in the troponin level, but you don't have that setting of acute ischemia, what the patient has is just an acute myocardial injury, which you can find in patients with myocarditis and in patients with heart failure. But once you have the two, the two conditions, both evidence of myocardial injury and setting of ischemia, then you can now say the patient has a, an acute myocardial infarction. So Dr. Edafi, can you please add one or two words about that? Yes. We are not hearing you clearly. Organization uh, looked at what source country. You are not hearing me. Can you? Okay, you are can clear you now. We can hear you now. Good. I said to simplify it. The World Health Organization came up with this. Um, uh, this. Um, uh, simplify algorithm for the uh, for the developing and low resource countries, saying that if a patient has a typical chest pain, or and also the patient had ECG in keeping with uh, your diagnosis of a heart attack, or you you can do. Oh, we're, we're losing cardiac enzymes and we're losing the cardiac enzymes like tropolin I or T are elevated. So any you also classify the patient as a heart attack. Yes, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me, sir? Now. Yes. Hello, sir. We can hear you. Hello, sir. We can hear you, sir. Go ahead. I said the WHO. Yes, I said the WHO has simplified the criteria for low resource country by saying 
typical chest pain, ECG, and the cardiac enzymes. So if you can pick two out of the list of uh, uh, criteria that Dr. Lalikon put on the slides, if you can pick two, that patient has a heart attack in oh. our setting. So send the patient for further evaluation. So Thank the heart too. attack can be an ST segment elevation as we saw in the case that we presented the both. Or it can also be SC segment, non SC segment elevation, which present as non STEMI. So any of them can be a spectrum. It can also be on a, what we call unstable angina. So yes, as, at any point you catch the patient, always uh, be always do good by asking the patient to go to the center where the coronary angiogram and other further investigation can be done quickly to save that patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So, um, going ahead, uh, doctor, that was talking about unstable angina and all the rest. So, we we'll look at ischemic heart disease as a spectrum of condition. And like I mentioned in the introduction that today, we're really talking about the type that is caused by obstruction to the coronary vessel. And looking at the image we have, we just want to go through the spectrum of the ischemic heart disease. And we have this coronary artery with the patent lumen, no obstruction. Then going forward, we have an atelomatous plaque forming due to deposition of fat and all other things in the intima. So you have this fixed plaque in the coronary vessel, reducing the size of the blood vessel. And you cannot compare the size of this to this and the amount of blood that we go through this compared to the one that we have a plaque forming. And with increasing the position of fat, the amount of the reduction keeps increasing. So at this point, once the patient exerts himself and you get to a certain level where there is imbalance in the oxygen demand and the oxygen supply to the myocardium, the patient can start having a chest pain. And at that point, what we say that the patient has is a stable angina. The patient has a fixed lesion in the coronary blood vessel. And once the patient takes time to rest, the pain comes down, but the pain is reproducible in a way that once the patient gets to that critical level, the patient starts experiencing the pain. That is stable angina. And proceeding forward, in the spectrum of the ischemic heart disease, after stable angina, what the patient will progress to is what we call the acute coronary syndrome. And under acute coronary syndrome, we have three entities. Unstable angina, the non ST segment elevated myocardial infarction, and ST elevated myocardial infarction. And what happens is there is either an erosion or disruption or breakage of the coverage of this plaque, leading to the exposure of the underlying um, area and with attendant platelet aggregation and formation of thrombus on top of that stable plaque. And once that happens, there's gradual reduction in the size of the blood vessel. So what you have in the unstable angina and non-ST segment elevated myocardial infarction is incomplete occlusion of the coronary vessel. But the difference between the two is once you have evidence of necrosis of the myocardium in terms of detection of the cardiac enzyme, what the patient has is a non-ST segment elevated myocardial infarction. But if you have this condition without the presence of elevated cardiac enzyme, what the patient has is unstable angina. And in ST segment elevated, elevated myocardial infarction, what you have is complete or total obstruction of the blood vessel. 
And that gives you that ST segment elevation you see when you look at the ECG of the patient. And other things that will point to you that this patient is no longer having a stable angina is there's going to be some change in the in the symptom, in the characteristic, in the character of the pain that the patient, pain or the discomfort that the patient is experiencing. Like I said, for discuss for stable uh, angina, what you have is a pain that comes up at a particular level, most after exertion and improves with rest. But by the time the patient gets to the acute coronary syndrome, starting from the unstable angina, the patient can now start having chest pain or discomfort at rest or with minimal exertion. Then the duration of the pain becomes prolonged and the pain increasingly gets worse over time. By the time you start having this, then you should know that your patient is no longer having a stable angina but has progressed to the acute coronary syndrome. And based on your ECG findings and the presence or absence of cardiac enzyme, you can now place the patient into any of these three categories. And just explaining further what I say, you have a set of symptoms at rest or with minimal exertion. The pain lasts seen longer now, and for unstable angina, there's no evidence of myocardial necrosis. But by the time you find your um, cardiac troponin, above the 99 percent percentile of the upper reference limits you know and there's no st segment elevation or you have st segment depression the patient has a non-st segment elevated elevation myocardial infarction and by the time you have other evidence of st segment elevation or new left bundle branch block on your ecg the patient already has a STEMI and should be managed as such and so, Dr. Edafi, you, you, you were part of the RACE study. Uh, can you just take us through some of the findings of the RACE study, sir? Hello, sir. Ask Hello, the question sir. again, sorry. Yes. I said you were part of the, the RACE study, looking at the yes. registry of acute coronary events in Nigeria. So, yes. can, can you just take us through some of the findings there? Very good. Uh, one is that um, that study has actually uh, 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 brought us to the limelight that we have this disease in the country. So the race study was set up um, around 2012, 2013, and it flowed down to almost 2018. That was where the data were collected. A number of hospitals uh, both uh, in southwest, south, south, southeast, and uh, many centers in the north uh, contributed to this uh, study. One of the things that strike off from this uh, uh, study is that uh, it seems that we have more of acute coronary syndrome in the north compared to, uh, uh, to the south. Uh, one of the explanation to give for that is uh, probably a patient may be uh, presenting uh, earlier in the north compared to the south, uh, because in the south here, when somebody is uh, sick, first he will call his pastor, and uh, the pastor may uh, the uh, the pastor may take him to the prayer house, and uh, before he gets to the hospital, he may take time. Sometimes they may not even get there. Then also in the north, uh, the the awareness is uh, may likely be more uh, in the north. The another issue again is that. Uh, uh, people also attribute to the food pattern that uh, in the south here, uh, fish and the uh, other uh, fish protein are more consumed compared to uh, and uh, compared to um, uh, to meat and other animal uh, 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 process of uh, uh, protein. Compa uh, see what we do in the north here. You know, in the north we take more of uh, uh, kilishi compared to uh, to the south. So. There are still vague area here and there, but the question now is this. A registry has come and uh, the study has also shown that we have a very a reasonable number of people with this uh, disease in our environment. And it's something that is common in our environment and is progressing and is growing. So we need to pay more attention to it. And, 
and if we don't pay attention to it, we may get to a point where we will enter an epidemic of this disease. So for us not to get to the point of epidemic of this disease, we need to pay more attention to it, and especially at the level of uh, prevention to see how people can stop smoking, because the risk factor that are identified here in Nigeria, they are also the same risk factor that also are there, that have been studied elsewhere uh, around the globe. Yes, Things sir. like cigarette cigarette smoking, yes, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and so on and so Adventure. forth. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. So, like 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 you said, the race that's the registry of acute coronary events in Nigeria show that this condition is with us. It's in the past that we used to say it is rare in black or in Africa. And ST segment elevation, Alcada infection, is actually the commonest in, in the study in Nigeria. And men affected more than male, and men also peaked like 10 years earlier than women and when during the study. And living in an urban area is actually a risk factor and also being in the upper and middle socioeconomic class. The, some of the explanation for this is that so, there are so many poor people that cannot even, that couldn't afford coming to the hospital. So maybe because this group of people have the means to present in those areas where intervention can be done, maybe this may explain why we have more of this. And it was also found that most of our patients present late to the hospital. The average time of presentation in this study was actually about six hours. And we will see later on in the presentation why it is important for our patients to present early. And like the case we presented that had arrhythmia following the myocardial infarction, arrhythmia was actually the commonest complication following myocardial infarction in the race, in the race trial. And so that is talking about epidemi epidemiology quickly. And so now we have made the definition, we stated the condition, both the WHO and the ESC, and we have looked at the epidemiology. Now, how do you diagnose myocardial infarction? And the tools that is needed starts from the history. You must be able to identify the symptoms, whether the typical symptom or the atypical symptoms. The knowledge of ECG is very, very important. And like we mentioned, whether using the WHO or the ESC, it is important to identify evidence of injury to the heart muscle which is the presence, either a rise or fall in the cardiac enzyme. So the key tools that is required to make your diagnosis is taking a good history, identifying abnormality on the ECG, and also detecting evidence of myocardial injury. If you have opportunity of doing an echo, that's an addition, then coronary angiography is also very important. But the basic tool that is needed is the first three highlighted in uh, that dark color. And so, but I should quickly state that while you are looking for history, you want to do all the tests, we should know that myocardial infarction is a medical emergency. And many of those things stated earlier will be happening concurrently. You will say, I must finish taking history before I go for ECG. Everything comes in together at the same time. So looking at the history, what are the likely presentation that you are going to be confronted with when you see this patient? So the common symptom that the patient with acute coronary syndrome will come up with is chest pain or chest discomfort. We will discuss about this into details later. Then some patients can come to you like, we talked about most of our patients not presenting early. Most of, some of them can come to you with complications. So they can come with arrhythmia, they can come in heart failure, they can come with different types of complications that 
what you are saying at that point is just a complication and not the acute presentation of the myocardial infarction. And some can even come to you dead, which is also a classification, one of the classification of myocardial infarction, that is type three. And some will be having myocardial infarction, will be having that attack without any obvious symptoms. They don't have pain, they don't have anything, but they can have some atypical symptoms, which if you are not very observant, you may miss. And this is common in elderly patients, in people with diabetes mellitus and in the female gender. So looking at the race trial in Nigeria, they also look at the common clinical presentation. So angina, that's the chest pain of discomfort, is the commonest, followed by palpitation. Then I talked about some atypical presentation, which is commoner in the group that I mentioned. So some of them can have dyspepsia, some can have uh, dyspnea, some can have syncopal attack. So these are the atypical symptoms that we have to be on the lookout for. And so now, talking into detail about the chest pain, it is not really this, it's not actually described as pain per se, but you have different types like chest discomfort, heaviness, like a weight on the chest. And then the one that is typically from cardiac origin has three cardinal characteristics. Number one is the location. This discomfort, the heavy weight, the, the, the weight on the, is usually substanar or retrostanar behind the sternum, usually. And like I said, this discomfort, depending on the stage you are in the spectrum of the ischemic heart disease, can be provoked by exertion. And like I said, by the time you get to the level of the acute coronary syndrome, can occur at rest or with minimal exertion. And the discomfort can be relieved by rest or with the use of medication, in this case, nitroglycerin. So when you have all these three characteristics in the patient, you will say that the patient has a typical angina or typical cardiac chest pain. When you have two out of the three, the patient has an atypical chest pain. Then when you have maybe just one or none of the three key characteristics, the patient has a non-cardiac chest pain and you should go further to know what is giving this patient's chest discomfort. So going over again, we talked about the location. It is retrosterna behind the sternum. And that is why you see the patient doing what the, the Levinstein, like making a fist around the sternum. So retrosterna, aggravative factor, physical stress, emotional stress. Like I said, it could also occur at rest in some patients. Rest or nitroglycerin can improve the pain, but we should be careful, especially with nitroglycerin, because patients with oesophageal spasm too have this kind of chest pain, and when you give them nitroglycerin, they can get better. Then the duration and the nature of the pain, the pain in acute coronary syndrome starts gradually and build up. So when you have a patient that has a very severe pain from the onset, it is less likely to be from ischemic heart disease. And the duration, like I talked about earlier, the duration, it keeps increasing as you go along that spectrum from unstable angina to non-ST segment elevated myocardial infarction and ST segment elevated myocardial infarction. And there could be associated diaphoresis, dizziness, in the context or in the presence of cardiovascular risk factor, the patient is hypertensive, there's diabetes mellitus, there's problem with the lipid, there's history of smoking, and you have these symptoms, then you should have an high index of suspicion that the patient is having a cardiac pain. Then what are the other characteristics that if you see, then it is less likely to be a cardiac pain. 
So if patient has a pleuritic chest pain, it is less likely to be cardiac. If the location of the pain is below the umbilicus, it is less likely to be cardiac in origin. If the patient can localize the location with a tip of the finger, because like you know, the cardiac pain is like a visceral kind of pain. It is dull, poorly localized. But if a patient can localize with the tip of a finger, and when you palpate, you also find tenderness around that area, it is less likely to be due to cardiac uh, issue. Then if the pain is reproducible or aggravated with movement, palpation of the chest wall, you are dealing most likely with costochondritis and the rest. Then a pain lasting a few seconds. I, to, I told you about pain in, uh, in myocardial infarction, it, 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 is, it is longer, at least 10 minutes and above. Then if the pain, if it's maximal at onset and the pain that radiates to the lower extremities is less likely to be due to cardiac condition. And looking at this diagram, Moving from left to right, you will see pointers that point to high probability of ischemic pain and the ones that are less likely. So if a patient has a sharp pain, fleeting pain, the one that shifts from one point to another, pleuritic positioner, it is less likely to be a typical angina. But if it's central, it should stand up behind the sternum, it's described like pressure, like uh, weight, heaviness, tightness, it's, uh, it's, it's radiating to the, to the shoulder, to the jaw, then there's high likelihood that this is due to angina. So Dr. Edafi, any additions, sir? Yes, very correct. Um, very good summary. So as uh, has already been said, the history is key to the diagnosis. When I, let me summarize it this way. When you are taking the history, look at the presenting complaint, exploit that presenting complaint, exploit everything around, then go into the risk factors. We, so these are the things that form that history. With the history alone, you have a very high index of suspicion that this is either MI or this is something different. So the pain is very important, is key in the history. So as Dr. Nalekon said, if the pain is sharp, sharp pain, breathing in, out, the pain is there, uh, leaning forward and uh, the pain is relieved, and uh, lying flat, the pain is small. Uh, the pain does not have any bearing with activity. Somebody will come and tell you that uh, I have a, I'm having a, a ischemic heart disease. When the person is, um, is doing treadmill for one hour every day, for two hours, for six hours every day, that is not likely. And when you ask the patient, when you are on your treadmill, or when you are exercising, does this pain come up? He said, no, the pain doesn't have any bearing. Then be very, um, still investigate the patient, still investigate that very particular individual, but it's likely or unlikely going to be an event of a heart attack. But when you get some story, very striking like this, doctor, if I want to, if I want to climb a staircase, I feel the pain. If I want to exercise, and the pain become more. But when I come, when I when I stop, the pain reduces. Doctor, if I want to make love with my wife, the pain is because I've seen patients like this. That is why I'm using this terminology. Doctor, if I want to make love with my wife, uh, because of the pain, I cannot even go half. Just know that that artery is there. That artery is blocked. Just know there are no two ways about that. Such languages are very striking to the diagnosis. So atypical presentation are very important, as Dr. Lalekon pointed out, because 
our environment here, peptic ulcer, ulcer disease, ulcer disease. I've seen many patients, ulcer disease. Before you get no, the whole arteries are all blocked up. So epigastric pain that may not be radiating. And if the risk factors are there, investigate that patient very fast. Don't leave Thank it you. at the point of omeprazole. Investigate that patient very fast. Thank so, you very and much, sir. And move on. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. The, the peptic ulcer disease you talked about um, makes me to remember one of the last set of angio that we did. Yes. This is patient, the, the, the guests that came from the, that had the family history of heart disease that has been treating give flux of suffragitis, yes. went all the way to Egypt to all do right. upper GI endoscopy and was treated for. But the pain persisted and the pain became worse. And it was said to us, by the time it came to us, the troponin was elevated. And by right. the time the angiography was done, it had triple vessel disease. Triple vessel disease, correct. And we had to refer him for coronary artery, artery bypass graft. So we've seen a lot of patients being treated for ulcer over and over again. At the end of the day, what they had was uh, ischemic heart disease. So we should be very, very careful. And so looking at other symptoms of presentation, like we said, some group of patients, especially women, patients with diabetes, they can have some atypical presentation. So some people can present with shortness of breath. Some people can present with syncopal attack, dizziness, palpitation, nausea, and vomiting. But when you have some of this presentation in the context of cardiovascular risk factor, please, you should consider the possibility of acute coronary syndrome or heart attack in this group of patients. And we should actually look for that. And so, like you said, chest pain, atypical presentation, family history, very, very important, like the patient I just mentioned, had family history of cardiac disease. Two sisters, one with uh, CRT, uh, one with two of them with cardiac devices. So there's a strong family history of cardiac illness in that family. So you should, we should look for that. We should actively ask for cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, problem with uh, the, uh, dys uh, dyslipidemia, smoking. We should look for all these obesity. So that should make, to be part of the history. We should not just be focused only on the chest pain alone. We should also look out for all those history of uh, cardiovascular risk factors. And when it comes to physical examination, most of the time, the examination is usually normal. But we should not forget, we can see evidence of hemodynamic instability. There could be hypertension, there could be elevated blood pressure, there could be tachycardia, and all others. And where physical examination we actually help is to help us to get other conditions that we present in a similar way. So your examination, you may be able to pick evidence during your examination that will confirm that whether this patient has pericarditis, if you can pick pericardia or up. If you do your blood pressure in both arms and you can find wide variation, this patient may actually be having aortic dissection. You can pick more, more which could be due to valvular heart disease, or you can pick brochial breath sand and all other things that will tell you that, oh, this patient is having pneumonia and not a uh, cardiac infarction. So that is where your examination will help. But for a patient with cardiac infarction, you may not actually find anything on examination. And for those one that comes with complication, you may be able to fix evidence of heart failure, presence of arrhythmia, and the rest like that. But the physical examination might actually not be that significant when you see this patient. And like I said, you can find evidence of heart failure, hemodynamic compromise, and all the rest like that. And going to the second 
call the important tool i said ecg so and we've done some series on ecg so it is very very important for us to have some basic knowledge of the ecg the ecg is very very important and the ecg can show us presence of abnormality in the st segment either st segment elevation or st segment depression we can see new uh, left boundary branch block pattern we can see abnormalities in the t-wave uh, uh, morphology but we should know that about four percent of patients with myocardial infarction we not have any abnormality on the ECG. And I should state, Dr. Adame talked about having two out of three of the criteria. So a normal ECG in the presence of elevated uh, cardiac enzyme and appropriate symptoms does not rule out acute coronary syndrome. And so what are we looking for on the ECG? So this is what we're going for in the ECG, the ST segments. That is the number two. So, and what we're looking for is, is, is the ST segment, is it elevated? And our reference point is that number one, that is the line between the, joining the P wave with the T wave. So, we're now going to look for our ST segment elevation starting from the J points. J point is the junction between the S wave and the beginning of the T wave. So if that area is elevated above that baseline, which is number one, that is ST segment elevation. And if it is below that line, that is ST segment depression. So that is what we're really looking for for those with ST segment elevation. And what is the cutoff? If you have ST segment elevation, one millimeter or more in all the leads, except in V2 and V3, where it should be greater than two in men and 1.5 in women, then you have an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. And for the one with ST segment depression, what you have is a down sloping or horizontal ST segment depression, 0.5 millimeter or more in two contiguous leads. Then you have a non ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Dr. Daffy, any addition, sir? Uh, no, not really. So, what, as you said, um, to summarize it up, very interesting. It has to be the contiguous leads. Yes, sir. Like you talk about lead two, lead three, and AVF. Look at the inferior surface of the heart. Then you talked about leads one, two, three, four, five, and lead uh, one. So yeah, lead two, three, four, five. They look at more of the anterior surface. Then you talk about uh, lead. Uh, AVL and leave V6, v, sometimes V5, V6, they, they look at the, the, uh, the, the lateral surface of the heart. Then they will talk, also talk about the mirror image of the heart. The mirror image is that what look at the, the posterior. There is no lead that look at the posterior. So we use V1, uh, V1 and V2 to look at the posterior. So this help us to know that this is the, so from the ECG, as Dr. Naliko said, you will be able to hazard, you'll be able to guess which artery is, which of the artery is, is the affected artery. Have you said this? Have you said this? You know, Dr. Naliko has pointed it out that the ECG may be normal, and yet the patient has acute coronary syndrome. So when the infection is on the uh, on the major vessel like uh, LAD, <coughs> circumference, uh, ROCA, you will have all this typical description. But sometimes, <coughs> when the faction is, for example, 
in the diagonal, you may have your ECG normal and the whole diagonal is gone. Your tropoly will be elevated. The whole diagonal is gone. So always be careful. If you have it, maybe OM, you may just see your ECG normal and the OM is totally occluded off. So ECG is not 100%, but when it occurs, it gives you a good guide to where you are going. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and like I said, when, when we started the investigation, most of these things are done concurrently. And the, the target is for us to be able to do this ECG within 10 minutes of a patient presenting with symptoms. So time is very, very important because the longer you wait, if the patient has myocardial infarction, the more myocardium that is lost in the process of waiting. So we want to do this ECG within 10 minutes and get the interpretation. And like Dr. Edafi mentioned, your twelve lead ECG, your our routine, regular twelve lead ECG might look normal. So for some patients, you may have to add extra lead. You know, our V6 ends at the mid, uh, mid axillary, mid axillary line. So you might actually have to put in some extra lead, like V7, V8, for you to be able to catch a patient with posterior infarction. Because like Dr. Edafi said, you cannot see that on your regular V1 to V6. And for some people, especially the one having uh, obstruction of the right coronary artery, you may also need to extend some leads to the right side of the chest for you to be able to identify those abnormality. And those are the, the, some of the uh, conditions where you can have a seemingly normal ECG in the presence of a patient having heart attack, apart from the involvement of the other not too big coronary blood vessel that Dr. Enafi talked, talked about. And so this is just looking at another ECG of our patients. And we can see what we have here. I was talking about the ST segment elevation. And like I said, the TP line where my cursor is, is the baseline. And we can see for this patient, we have almost about three to four millimeter of ST segment elevation right from let's say obviously from V2 to V6 in this patient. And this is a real life ECG of one of the guests we have managed in this uh, facility successfully. And when we see things like this, please, as urgent as possible, this patient should be referred to a specialist center like cardio care where uh, coronary angiography and PCI can be done as urgent as possible. And so the top two, like we talked about, is the cardiac enzyme. So, and what is used now is the troponin. The era of uh, CKMB, myoglobin has gone. So the standard now is to use high sensitivity troponin, either troponin I and troponin T, to be able to identify evidence of injury to the myocardium. The troponin is elaborated in the blood in the setting of uh, myocardial ischemia as early as two hours to four hours. By six hours, it is there and it could be there for up to 14 days. So once a patient has the, uh, the setting, so we should quickly ask for the troponin to be checked, either troponin C or troponin I. And once you have that elevation, then you should know that this patient has evidence of myocardial injury, plus this evidence of ischemia in terms of symptom and ECG finding, then you have made your diagnosis. And like ECG, your first troponin may also be normal. So there may be need to do a serial check 
of the patient's troponin. So patient comes in, the troponin is normal. Then you should check about six hours. Like you find on this slide that it starts coming up from two to four hours. By six hours, you can see a substantial increase. And like we discussed, either a rise or fall in the level above the 89 percent of the upper reference limits is diagnostic of myocardial injury. And so by the time you put all this together, then you have clinched your diagnosis of myocardial infarction. So other investigations that can be done, these are the basic ones like we talked about. So other investigations that can be done, like for example, a patient that has his uh, chest pain after exertion, the patient can actually be sent for his stress ECG when you are not sure or the pretest probability as in presence of other cardiovascular risk factor is not that clear, that patient can be sent for a stress ECG for us to do and the stress ECG may be able to reveal the typical changes that is expected in the ECG or the patient might have symptoms or there could be evidence of hemodynamic instability during the period of this test. Other investigation I talked about, echocardiography can be done, which will show wall motion abnormality that is compatible with the area of the suspected uh, coronary vessel. Then other things that will also be done, chest x-ray. Chest x-ray is not for the diagnosis of myocardial infarction, but chest x-ray can help you to isolate other differential diagnoses. You can have evidence of pneumonia, pneumothorax. You can see evidence of um, dilatation of the aorta that can point you towards possibility of aortic dissection and the rest like, like that. So these are other investigations. But the important investigations, as we talked about, is to do an ECG and for us to check your troponin. And once you have done this, the next thing is to start the management of these patients. And what is the principle of treatment? To just summarize the principle of the treatment, one, what you want to do is Hello, you want to restore blood flow to the myocardium as Hello, fast as possible. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So be just before we go to uh, treatment, eh, let me just add something to the... Uh, in, uh, to the investigation. Yes, sir. So, if you look at the way the matter is flow from your history, you have exam. We have also examined. We have taken the history. And we investigated. So you now the next thing you now do what we call the risk stratification of the patient. So the risk stratification of the patient is uh, is done for those that are high risk. If it is STEMI, you don't even need to do any much restratification. The patient goes straight to the, uh, wow. to the cancer. So if it is um, a patient that uh, has STEMI or unstable agina, you can now, so you can, you can still buy some time. Because in STEMI, if, you, if the ECG show that there is SC segment elevation, the time is myocardium. You don't need to buy any time. Go as fast as possible. Primary PCI. If it is not, then you now initiate pharmacoinvasive. But here is this: if that you do this, you do all this, and you are getting non-STEMI and the rest, you can do a TIMI score or the GRACE score. So when you restratify, you can group them into low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. Those that are high risk, straight to the cat lab immediately. Those that are intermediate risk, you can buy your time. Then all this investigation now comes in, stress ECG, a CT coronary angio uh, uh, angiogram with uh, calcium score, all of them now come in according to the guideline. So we should, as much as possible, pursue the need of our patient and the benefit of our patient as we practice cardiology. Thank you very much. Thank I you. just want to make I just want to make it as simple as possible yeah. and not go into all those big, big details. But thank right. you for the, for the addition. And like I right. said, for the, 
for the principle of treatment, I said the most important is to make sure that you restore blood flow to the myocardium as fast as possible. As fast as possible, like Dr. Edafi said, for those with ST segment elevated myocardial infarction, you should take them to CAT lab as soon as possible, especially when you have that facility. And where you don't have that facility, another thing that can be done is to open, is to restore blood flow by using thrombolytic agents, agents that will break down the clot blocking the coronary blood vessel. So you can do that, but just make sure that by any means, either by going to the cat lab to do stain, to do angiography and stenting, or by using thrombolytics for patients that does not have contraindication to reperfuse the myocardium as early as possible, then all other things can now follow by inhibiting the process that leads to the formation of the throm thrombus, by inhibiting the action of the platelets, by use, use, uh, using anticoagulants to make sure that blood flows freely and the viscosity, viscosity of blood is reduced, using things that will stabilize the plaque and drugs that help dilate the blood vessel to improve blood flow. So, these are other things that can be done and that we'll see as we go on in the treatment. So, make sure that you restore blood flow as fast as possible. You need to take care of the risk factors, the hyper, hyperlipidemia, blood sugar, high blood pressure. Then you need to treat any complication that the patient has in terms of either heart failure, arrhythmia, and to rehabilitate the patient. And like I was saying, Time is very, very important. Because the longer you wait, the more viable myocardium you lose while waiting. So the goal is to get the blood supply restored as fast as possible. Because by the time you get to 12 hours or more, the damage is already done and salvaging the heart muscle might be very, very difficult. So time is critical. And in myocardial infarction, time is muscle. The same way time is neural in stroke. So how do we achieve all these principles that I've talked about? So I, like I said initially that this is an emergency condition. And so the patient comes in, get your ECG within 10 minutes and get it interpreted. And as you are doing that, give your patient aspirin, 300 milligram to chew. So the aspirin is, going, is an anti, is one, is an antiplatelet, it's going to help. It also, also has an analgesic effect. So it's going to help in relieving the pain. Then other agents that you need to give, Oxygen, if the patient is desaturating, that is, if the SpO2 is less than 90% is of guidelines, some says 92%. If the patient is not desaturating, if the oxygen saturation is greater than 92, there is no need to give oxygen. And even in that condition, giving your oxygen can be harmful to the patient. Then the use of nitrates in forms of either your spray or tablet to the patient. What this will do, it has a vasodilatory effect on both the coronary, on both the artery and the vein. So it helps dilate the coronary blood vessel in, by, so thereby improving blood flow to the myocardium. In reducing, it has also in reducing the preload and thereby reducing the work the myocardium is done, it's actually reducing the tension in the, in the muscles. So the oxygen demand is also reduced. So it helps in a lot of ways, helping to reduce the myocardial oxygen demand. But we should be careful. Patients that are taking uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitor, for example, Viagra, all those drugs, 
within 24 some cases to 48 hours should not be given nitroglycerin or patients with hypertension blood pressure less than 90 60 please don't give them and if patient has ischemic changes in lead 2 3 and avf which is which is which is which is uh, which is inferior mi you should not give them nitroglycerin and that is why it is important for you to refer your patient to a specialist then other use of antiplatelets like clopidogrel is also advocated then the use of statin statin apart from treating dyslipidemia is also for stabilization of the plaque because we talk about the plaque rupturing and leading to thrombus formation and other things starting kickstarting the process of obstruction to the blood vessels then other medication that is useful especially when there's evidence of left ventricular dysfunction or heart failure patients should be given ac inhibitor or arb then beta blocker is also very important especially if the blood pressure is good and there's no evidence of cocaine induced myocardial infarction so beta blocker help you to reduce the heart rates helps to reduce the work rate of the heart and also so thereby reducing the oxygen demand of the heart and so that helps in improving the patient's condition and so there are different pneumonies so monash so i forgot to talk about morphine morphine has a lot of it's actually relieve in reducing the level of anxiety the patient has it has an analgesic effect as with managing the pain it also has some dietary effect on the vessel but we should also know that it can also give results in hypertension so we should be careful when we're giving morphine nitroglycerin beta blocker you should also be watchful and be on the lookout for possible reduction in blood pressure and patients that are going to give morphine many of them may vomit so you may need to give an anti-emetic along with that so dr dafi i'll hand over to you to talk about uh, reperfusion strategy sir hello sir hello dr dafi i think you will join us so let me continue so I talked about restoring blood flow to the myocardium as fast as possible. So, and I talked about the strategy. If you have access to where PCI can be done as, as fast as possible, ideally within the first 90 to 120 minutes, the patient should be sent there and should do an angiography and percutaneous coronary intervention, that is stenting, opening up the obstructed area and putting a stent or like a wire mesh to keep the place open. But if you cannot achieve that within two hours, according to the guideline, and you can, the patient has no contraindication to the use of thrombolytic agents. So you can actually do that to break down the clots and open up the block blood vessel and restore a uh, blood supply to the affected area. Dr. Edafi, are you back? Hello, sir. Okay, you will join us. So like I said, time is very, very important. So the goal is for you to be able to do, open up the blood vessel within 90 to 120 minutes. And if you don't have access to that, fibrinolysis should be done as fast as possible. But even in patient that goes through the route of the thrombo, use of thrombolytic agent, there may still be need to do PCI. Some patients will do that, but they are still not getting better. So there could be failed, failed thrombo, thrombolysis. So the patient still need to do a PCI. If after PCI, the patient is still unstable and the patient is still having ongoing chest pain, even dynamic compromise, the patient needs PCI. And some patients are not actually qualified to do PCI because, for example, 
patient with non-ST segment elevated myocardial infarction. Please, this is very important. Patients with ST segment depression on ECG, patients without a, a prolonged ST segment elevation, please, this patient should be treated only with PCI. They should not be given thrombolytic agents. Please, ST segment depression, transit ST segment elevation, please, this patient should do PC high after, as soon as possible after commencement of the medical therapy we talked about earlier. Hello, Dr. Edafi. So I don't think it's with us. Maybe it's, it's, it's having network problem over there. So like I said, I talked about the n -stemine. They should have only coronary angiography with or without percutaneous coronary intervention. And this patient does not qualify for thrombolysis. Then, like I talked about, oxygen is recommended only where there's oxygen and uh, where there's desaturation. Like I said, between 90 to 92, most guidelines actually said less than 90%. And the use of all the medical therapy we talked about, the aspirin, the antiplatelets, the statin, the use of beta blocker is also indicated in this class of patients. And like I said, for patients that will do thrombolysis, we should also note the contraindication to thrombolysis in this patient. So I have these two tables listing the contraindication to fibrinolytic therapy. So patient with previous intracranial hemorrhage, patient with ischemic stroke, patient with major gastrointestinal bleeding or other bleeding disorders, they should not have, you should not use thrombolytic agents in them. These patients should be referred to centers where angiography and PCI could be done. So this table is showing the absolute contraindication. There's also some relative contraindication, blood pressure, infective endocarditis, active peptic ulcer, patient on oral anticoagulation therapy because of risk of bleeding. So all this should be taken into consideration before you consider your patients for fibrinolytic agents. But I think the most important for us to know is to make a timely diagnosis in this group of patients, at least patients should take aspirin. Here we have 75 milligrams. Can take four tablets of that aspirin, chew it. You can give your statin, you can give clopidogrel. If there's indication for use of ACE inhibitor ARB, you can start the patient on them, and the patient should be sent as early as possible to centers where interventions can be done for them. And so this is just a picture showing our, our cat lab here and uh, in the process of a patient having coronary angiography and uh, PCI. And, and that is Dr. Edafi, the lead uh, intervention cardiologist at work there. So I don't know if Dr. Edafi is back. Hello? Yeah. Oh. Yes, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I've been trying to bring you in from the post of uh, repartition strategy. So I don't know if you can help us go on with the repartition strategy, either PCI or thrombolysis. Good. So for people who are, if the, the problem occur at a hospital or a town where there are no um, cat labs, so the first thing is to do what we call the pharmacoinvasive uh, therapy. If not, primary PCI would be the IDT. So the pharmacoinvasive therapy is that where you are, you have either streptokinase, or you have um, atylase, or you have uh, tenetaplase, you give for those that have STEMI. For those that have STEMI, you do that uh, strategy for them. So immediately you give, 
then you move the patient because you know that by the, the distance between where the uh, where you are the hospital where they met you and you you administer this therapy so where the patient will get a, 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 a coronary angiogram done is more than 120 minutes. So go ahead, give your drugs. And after that, you refer the patient to a hospital that has the capability of PCI, like, uh, uh, like the cardio care now. So you refer the patient, the patient gets there, then we can now do what we call um uh Edda, uh, PCR, or rescue PCI. Yes, uh, for the uh, for the case. But for those that have what uh, Dr. Laliko just said, maybe 90 minutes, the patient, the preferred thing is you can do and uh, and uh, and address the corporate lesion. So but if that patient has a triple vessel disease and the patient is diabetic, and uh, so the first thing is you discuss the strategy. Patient can do, uh, can go for uh, uh, for uh, uh, for a surgical bypass uh, surgery uh, for a bypass bypass surgery, or the, uh, if the patient did not agree, then you can sign a high risk consent and still go ahead with PCI. But I usually advise them for triple vessel disease, left main involvement, uh, diabetic with triple vessel disease, go for surgical revascularization, which is the bypass surgery after the coronary angiogram. So the coronary angiogram is the deciding factor. After the coronary angiogram, you can decide that, okay, this patient will require PCI. The patient go for percutaneous coronary intervention, all this group of people will require a uh, surgical bypass, then you can go for that. There are scores which we, we may not bother our head with here, like the SINTA score or the modified SINTA score, the clinical SINTA score, or this can also be used to aid what, you, what, what is this of each of these procedures, either a PCI or surgical bypass. So this is the way, or is there any mechanical complication? Because I've seen a patient who had, uh, who had, uh, who had semi and he had a posterior wall rupture. And that oh. posterior wall rupture, obviously, and it was a contained rupture. That patient will require, even though it's something that you can open up in PCI, you will not attempt that. Because the, surgery, the surgeon will go in do a repair of that posterior uh, wall rupture, then go ahead and, uh, and, uh, and graft and take a graft to bypass the point of total occlusion for that patient. So such group of people, they are candidates for surgical revascularization. So these are the way we decided. So many things inform your decision. How many legions are there? Where are those legions? What are the risk factors? What are the complications that follow after the PCI? Is there any mechanical complication? Then also the decision, the, the choice of the patient. Or the patient may say, no, I don't want surgery. This is what I want. Or the patient may say, no, I don't want PCI. I want surgery. So it depends on what the patient wants. So all these are things that you must put before the patient or the table of the patient to make a, a decision on what he or she wants in proceeding for the revascularization. Yeah, Dr. Lalika. Okay, thank you, Chief, for those additions. And I don't know if you can see my, can you see our video from your end? Yes, I can see it, sir. Okay, so I just want you to take us through the, the video I want to play of uh, that same case we present with the, the angels, the angel video. Good. Good. Can I go ahead and play? Yes, go ahead, sir. Oh, sorry. I think I... I'm hearing you, sir. Okay. Okay. Can you see the video, sir? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. I said you should just take us through. Good. So, you see that 
Yeah, the first thing is that we came from, uh, we use the femoral access here. From, because you can see that the catheter is coming from the aorta, the abdominal aorta, I can see the catheter going up and navigating its way to, uh, to the ascending aorta. So here we have that uh, the left main, this is the left main coronary artery that the catheter has engaged here the left main coronary artery. So the left main coronary artery divided into the anterior descending artery and the circumference artery. So the anterior descending artery, anterior descending artery is totally occluded. That is the LAD, totally occluded. And you can see that the, the wire has gone in, wire has passed through. And the wire that passed through, uh, I think we are uh, I'm using my phone because my system, uh, the network shut down there. So, okay. Yes, it's my phone that I'm using. So I can, the pictures are small, but I can still make something out of it. So okay. you, can, you can see here that uh, the, left, the, 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 left make, uh, the left anterior descending artery is already open down uh, from this uh, line. Yeah, you can see before and after. See the point of occlusion where you have uh, uh, the yellow hand, the yellow hand, and the point of uh, revascularization and how the vessels have opened them. So this is before and after the uh, PCI to so the left anterior descending artery. Thank you, sir. So, like you said in the case presentation, the patient had obstruction in the mid portion of the left anterior descending artery yeah and that was exactly what was described and so these are the points when the wire was passed and the obstructed area being inflated with the balloon then this after the stating you can appreciate the the difference in the blood flow through that blood vessel before and after, and this is what the process of coronary angiography and the PCI is about. And this is what we do in cardiac care routinely. So when you have your patients, like you said, time is of essence. Send them as soon as possible, possible. for this treatment, because this treatment is life-saving. We'll be able to save a lot of our patients, because most of them comes in late, like I said from the race study, average most only less than ten percent of our patients comes in within the first two hours, and most of the time, by the time patient comes in, they already have complication, heart failure, ventricular aneurysm, arrhythmias. That even despite restoring blood supply to the myocardium, we already have established complication which the patient is going to manage for the rest of their life. So timing is very important. So it is good to send this patient as early as possible. We can help in interpreting the ECG. We, the, we can do the cardiac troponin. If patient need to do echocardiography, stress ECG, stress echocardiography, everything is available. So the whole gamut of investigation that is needed is available and your patient can benefit from them as soon as possible. So in conclusion, like we have discussed, myocardial infarction is a medical emergency. And from the race study, this condition is here with us. Having a good knowledge of ECG is very important in making the diagnosis. And timely referral to the specialist center is very, very important. And the most important case is to prevent, because like we say, prevention is cheaper, easier, and better than kill. So prevention yeah. is identifying the cardiovascular risk factors, doing everything possible to make sure that we prevent or we treat these risk factors if they are there, and we'll be able to prevent our patients from having a heart attack. So, Dr. Edafe, what is your final word before we start taking questions, can I, sir? Can I add something? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, so, sir. 
I'm going to just try and show a similar thing, but we'll try and show the process as it goes. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we do, uh, I'm going to show you how the process goes for the um, Corona. No, that's Doctor. That's Doctor Eseko talking. Yes, Some sir. people are wondering. Okay, my name is Doctor Eseko. <laughs> <laughs> and this cardiac care hospital, I'm sure you can see the video. Yes, sir. Um, this, this is a, a cardiac OR. Now, this is a cath lab, and I, I will go shortly to show you how the procedure is done. And I'll be pausing and showing you what is being done at the time of each of them. Um, these are some of our ICU areas and some of the areas that you already have, if you have been to cardiac care. These are some things that you can see, and it's here in Nigeria. That is us in the cath lab, and I will just show you exactly what we'll do. This is us showing how the procedure goes to um, participants. Now, you can see this. What happens is that we put in a needle into the femoral artery, then we bring it out and pass a wire, and that wire is what helps us. So the same way you set an IV line or you set a, a line for, um, so that you can see that, we now leave the wire inside the artery after puncturing it. Then we pass a sheet over that wire that will now stay there that has a valve to stop blood from going back. So we put in the sheet. That's what the sheet looks like. And after I'm doing the sheet, the next thing now is to pass the catheter in. So that's what the sheet looks like. Then we pass the catheter in all the way to the heart. The patient is awake. Is not feeling any much any pain at all. When we do that, then we can look at the heart and find where the blockage is, like in this um, schematic video. I hope you all can understand. And we can all see this video. I hope we can see where the blockage is in this video. Yes, you can. Yes. yes. So, um, so that is uh, what we see after that. We saw after that angel, and the next thing, of course, after that, is that we pass in a wire. And we use that so you can see that wide and clear. So you can see this. What we are passing is a small coronary wire. That wire will pass through this catheter here and pass through that lesion that is blocked. And then after we pass through that lesion, then we'll now use that. And um, you can see how we are passing it. Then we pass it straight through whatever is blocked in while we are looking at it on the screen. When we pass it through, then over that wire, we pass a balloon in. The balloon will now come in and inflate and prepare the lesion for us so that we can deploy a stent. I think that's really clear. Then we over the wire again, we now pass a stent. And we can see what the stent it looks like. It's a metallic mesh-like structure that we put there and then it stays there. Now, this mesh-like structure, we expand it with this um, inflation device. So it's not a normal syringe that we just use. Why? We have to measure the exact pressure that we use to inflate that balloon and that stent. Otherwise, it will rupture that coronary vessel and cause a very big problem. So this device is what we use connected to the stent, and we use that to inflate that stent just like you saw, and then the vessel remains um, open thereafter. So I will show you what happened in this particular patient. Um, now you can see why we are inflating. You can see the area that is showing um, you can see the area that is showing the stent being deployed. And this is that coronary wire that we passed in. This is the catheter we passed in through across that blockage. And then we can now deploy the stent using that inflation device that is measuring exactly how many atmospheres. After we do that, we do an angio again, get dye and pass it through that catheter to check whether the, and you can see, you can see that place that was blocked now is now opened up because the stent is there and it remains open throughout. Um, so you can see it's very clean, clear, actually, um, like um, everything, like not, I, I think nothing happened. I think that's clear. Doctor, I think so. Yes, yes very sir. clear. Very, very clear. clear, sir. Okay, very so clear. that is something that, that we can know um, that we do. You can see another case. This was for a 42-year-old computer engineer. He did not know he had diabetes, and then he came in with a heart attack. 
This is one of the few cases that we're able to manage on time. And you can see the blockage right there. Okay. You can see the blockage right there. That's one of the cases that we managed. If you see this case, you can see there's no flow here before. But if you look up afterwards, you can see that now there's, this is us putting the stents, putting the stent. And you see this picture, you can see that the after is showing um, after flow. So you can see before and you can see the after. Um, very nice uh, result after the procedure. So that is what is done and restores blood for reducing the chest pain and increases um, um, ability for the patient to um, survive um, properly as soon as, it, as soon as possible. Okay, um, over to you, Dr. Um, Edafe. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you so much, Dr. Seko. Great work. Dr. Laleko, I must thank you very much for the excellent uh, and uh, beautiful presentation. I always enjoy your, your stuff. Uh, thank so you. So, it, yeah, it's very good. You did it excellently and it's well explained. So there is no much to add rather than to say that MI is around, the, is, is within us. There are people that don't even have the risk factor that we are looking out for, but they come down with MI. And if we see people with risk factors, we should also evaluate them well. So anybody you see, as far as I'm concerned, the high index of suspicion and look out for it. If it is not there, good. If it is there, uh, let appropriate things be done for the patient for the patient to so thank you very much sir thank you so remember that if thank you look you in the chat much, box sir. if you look in the chat box there's a link you can click to join um the whatsapp group so that you can you can ask your questions there even after the message after the teaching you can have if you have specific cases that you want us to help um you can also keep on teaching thereafter so if you just click on that link you can join the chat group and uh, we can be of assistance in one way or the other. There are some questions, but I want to also show, um, I want to show um, the way we also do this. Uh, can, we, can you see my screen, please? Yes. Yes, so sir. The same, the same pro procedure is also done in the peripheral limbs. Similar like it's done, you can see there's a blockage here, there's no blood flow here. And then thereafter we deploy the stents um, in the area to restore the blood flow. You can see that there. And then after deploying the stents with, with that inflation device, you can see the blood supply now going for and see the leg before and see the leg after. So it's a similar kind of um, technology that is used in vessels around the body and it's here available in Abuja. So people don't have to travel outside the country um, for this. Um, so it's important for us to know and uh, be able to treat our patients appropriately. Um, I also want to show you some, this case where we removed a foreign body from the heart using a coronary snail wire. You can see this thing here. That is a, a foreign body in the heart, a catheter that was dislodged into the heart. And you can see us trying to pull it down from inside the heart without surgery. The patient was awake and uh, we brought it down. It's now in the middle rib cage. I can see it's coming down. It has come down to the point where it's about to come out. And then here it is. It was 27 centimeters long. And so this is uh, was done here in Abuja um, by the team in Cardio Care. And our paper is coming out. Dr. So Daffy, our paper should have come out by now. This is what it yes, looks sir. like. This is what it looks like. I can we'll, see how we'll, long we'll it was. We will publish it in the next one more. 27 centimeters. Uh -huh. You can see how long it was. And Very that was going on somebody's heart. She went home the same day. Yeah, um, 27 after centimeter. That. Very clear. Now, you can also see how a pacemaker is also done in the cat lab. Um, we take a small incision, mm. then we put in um, the pacemaker lead through the subclavia into the heart, and then we take it straight into the heart, and then we now interrogate it and make sure it is there. So I hope we can see that very well. And then we connect it to the um, battery and then put it inside under the skin. So the patient can walk around. Nobody will know that anything is there. So we do this for pacemakers, for CRTs as well in the cat lab, which may follow some of these procedures. Okay? So that's some of the things I just wanted to share. 
please join the group and then you can ask questions. You can ask for specific cases. But anytime you ask a question in our WhatsApp group, we will, re we will require you to make an attempt to answer it. Um, Dr. Um, Olalekon, there are some questions in the chat box. In the yes. Um, so let, let's quickly take them. Um, there's a question here about what is the dose of nitrates and the rules of administration? Sublingua or Pirentra? So for nitrates, for nitroglycerin, I will answer them. Um, Dr. Dafi and Dr. Isako can also add. You can, there are so many routes you can use. You can use the oral routes, they are topical, but routinely what we do is to use the either the spray or the subligua tablets. 0.5 microgram. You can use air, like three times within 15 minutes. You give one. After five minutes, you can give another one, but maximum of three within 15 minutes. Then there are also uh, IV routes for for it. So you can, but routinely for starts, you can do your spray the same way under the under the tongue. Spray every five minutes times three doses. So there's pilentra, there is spray, there is oral, there is topical, diff, a lot of uh, uh, formulation that can be used. Uh, any addition, Dr. Seko and Dr. That, that, that's fine, that's fine. Let's go with, we are running out of time, so we need to move a little bit faster. So which of the statin do we use? For the statin, what study has shown is to give high, uh, high intensity starting as in starting at a relatively higher dose. That is what the Timmy Pruvi study, the miracle study, has shown. For miracle study, at over starting was used at 80 milligrams. So for this patient. They are not the patient that will give 10 milligrams of statin or simvastatin. If you want to use uh, atovastatin at 80 milligrams or your rosuvastatin at 40 milligrams daily, that is what you give to this group of patients. And I'll talk about the benefits, not only to reduce lipid level, but for stabilization of the plaque in the coronary blood vessel. Then there's a question, can one take a new routine or cardiotol supplement for blood vessel cleansing? Um, <laughs> all we're discussing are things that have been tested on in several studies. There are guidelines, there are studies to prove the efficacy of everything we have mentioned in the treatment of patients with myocardial infarction. As of now, and to the best of my ability, I don't think there has been studies to show that all these supplements actually do anything in the treatment of patients with coronary artery disease. So I will not uh, recommend anything that is not guideline and scientifically based. Any addition, Dr. Edafi? No, that is correct. Okay, thank you, sir. That is correct, yeah. Go ahead, sir. Then okay. there's a question here that how do we differentiate the shoulder pain of a patient with myocardial infarction and that of peptic ulcer disease? How do we differentiate the shoulder pain of a patient with MI and that of peptic disease? Dr. Davisa, you can help us with that. Okay, for the shoulder pain of uh, the shoulder patient pain with myocardial infarction and peptic ulcer disease. That is epigastric pain. I, I think that the is person pain. is epigastric pain, the person wants to talk about. Yes. Because there is no shoulder so pain in peptic ulcer disease. Exactly, exactly. For epigastric pain, one is that you will you will get a history that this patient 
has a sharp epigastric pain, but that that is coming from the heart, even though it's atypical, it is dull in nature around the epigastric region. Then another thing is that you, the pain that is coming from the heart, it may be intermittent. In initial, uh, intermittent comes and go, comes and go, and it lasts for maybe a period of uh, 10, 20 minutes. As the, uh, the, the artery gets narrows, it keeps lasting longer, longer, longer. Why that of the epic, uh, the peptic ulcer may just be a continual uh, pain until you relieve it with, uh, with these uh, medications or you do something to relieve that uh, uh, acid reflux, uh, uh, acid uh, around the uh, ulcer crater. Then another thing is that uh, you look out for the risk factor. The risk factors are there for myocardial infarction, but for epigastric pain, yes, they may also have the risk factor. So if the risk factors are present and if you want to distinguish each of them, evaluate and uh, and be sure you are dealing with uh, that of myocardial infarction. The other thing again is that the epigastric pain of uh, peptic ulcer usually is typical ulcer pain, usually radiate to the back. And uh, if it is a stomach ulcer, uh, it, it tells you that when, uh, when they are uh, hungry, the, the pain becomes more intense. But if it is a duodenal ulcer, when they are uh, when they eat, the, became, the pain become more intense. But these two pain usually radiate to the back and it's more of sharp in, na uh, in nature. And uh, for that of the epigastric, uh, uh, that of peptic ulcer, when you do your ECG, it would be definitely be normal. But that of uh, uh, myocardial infarction, ECG may show you a taste sign of myocardial infarction, propylene will be elevated in myocardial infarction. It will be normal in peptic ulcer. You do your echo, it may show abnormality in uh, myocardial infarction and it will be normal in peptic uh, ulcer. So these are the way we go about it. And the, drug med the drugs and the medication also follow. For uh, pain that is coming from the heart, if you take your, uh, uh, your, uh, your nitroglycerin, even though it's not specific, it's that, that pain tends to, uh, tends to relieve. But that of peptic ulcer has no effect at that point. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. But, but I want to just add that most patients, yes. please do an ECG, please. Yes. 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 Don't, don't depend yes. on the history alone. Every patient to just Every patient that presents with epigastric pain. ECG must be done. Please, once you have a lot of gastric pain, please do an ECG. It's cheaper than trying uh, over and over again, especially if you treat it and the patient is not getting well. Please and please do an you ECG. Right. And especially in women, please do an yes, ECG. Women, elderly, yes. And, um, yes, and those with diabetic. Yes, because sir. they may just have what we describe as. Uh, Silent MR. Oh, angina equivalence. Oh, okay, I, I want to just say, say that if you want to refer to cardio care, if you look on the screen, you'll see the numbers you can call, um, email, because and where we are located, yes, and how to yes. refer to cardio care. Thank you, sir. Is there Thank any you, difference sir. in sensitivity and specificity between troponin I and troponin T in detecting myocardial injury? There is actually no, di no difference. Any one that you have, you should use. The most important thing is to know the cutoff that is important in making your diagnosis. Whether troponin T, whether troponin I, they are equally both sensitive and specific. So why is nitroglycerin contraindicated in patients with inferior world MI? In patients with inferior World myocardial infarction, there's usually associated right ventricular failure. And in this group of patients, the patients actually depends a lot on a good venous return into the right ventricle to be able to be hemodynamically stable. 
And when I was talking about the effect of nitrates, one of the effects is dilatation of both the base and the artery and reducing the preload. So in this group of patients, if you reduce the preload in presence of a patient that already having a weakened right ventricle, then you are actually hasting the patient's death. So in patients with inferior MI, hypertension, question or doubt about the use of phosphodiesterase, if we talk people using Viagra and all the rest, please do not give them nitro glycerin in any form. So it is important for you to take your history, check your blood pressure and do a good examination as fast as possible to be able to identify this contraindication. Someone asked that, can heart attack cause a cardiac arrest? Yes. I talked about arrhythmia being the commonest complication in patients with um, acute coronary events in the study done in Nigeria. So that is why some, a lot of people make mistakes between heart attack and cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest can happen after heart attack because in, heart, in cardiac arrest, what you have is destruction in the electrical activity of the heart. So it can happen after heart attack and it's one of the prominent complications. And that is why it is very important to make sure you restore because once the myocardium is damaged, there's scar in the heart and those can be the source of generation of this fatal arrhythmia that can lead to cardiac arrest. Next question, good evening. Please do we do Monash ABC for myocardial ischemia too? Very, very important because the, the pathophysiology is the same and you don't need to wait till your patient actually have develop the closest total infarction of the myocardium before you start intervening. So looking at all the steps involved in the formation of the, uh, of the plaque, the, uh, the cholesterol, the role of, the, of, of platelets. So you need to use all this medication. Use your antiplatelets, use your lipid medication, give the patients drugs to take care of the other risk factor, hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, diabetes, and the rest. So you can use them for patients with myocardial ischemia. And I, I, I think we've gone through the question. Let me look at the chat box if... Somebody yeah. asked, do you have ambulance transfer to aid transfer of referred patients? The answer is yes, we do. And we typically pick up patients from the airport if they are coming from out of town or occasionally from other hospitals. But you have to call ahead, and I think I shared um, how to reach us, how to reach the hospital. Um, somebody asked um, that is there any difference? How, do we have any data to show socioeconomic class of those who need access? Who who need this intervention? The truth of the matter is that it's affecting everybody. Old, poor, rich, <laughs> thin, fat, diabetic, oh, non-diabetic, yeah. hypertensive, non-hypertensive, everybody. We have seen 35-year-olds with complete blockage. We have seen 42-year-olds. We have seen 60-year-olds. We have seen the very, very, very poor. People that cannot open card of 2,000 naira have come with MI. So, um, yes, it affects everybody. We hope that with the new NHIS Act that this will, I mean, this, this procedure can be available to everybody, irrespective of whether they can afford it or not. Uh, I don't know if there are any other questions again. In that I don't think there's any other. Thank you very much. And like I said, you can refer your patients for all these services. And we do a good back referral to you when you send your patient to us. We give a good report of the findings, what was done, and the follow-up treatment, and your patient comes back to you. We get patients from every part of the country, not 
south, 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 and people living with good reports, good results. They have been patients that have, we have followed up for two years, more than a year, doing well after uh, angiography and PCI, after um, different type of cardiac devices, pacemaker, ICD, uh, CRTD, and they are doing well. So when you send your patients, you get a good referral back on what you have done and how you can follow up the patient's management. So, and apart from the cardiology service, like I said, we also have the endocrine and metabolic units, the nephrology with the dialysis center, the neurology visit uh, units, EEG, spirometry, all these are available. So, we are just like uh, Dr. Seko used to say, one hour flight from anywhere in this country. And once you get to Abuja, if you need the ambulance service or the car service to pick you from the airport, it is readily available. So we, we, we thank everybody for joining us today. Despite the fact that it is a uh, Salah youth. So for our Muslim brother, we wish you happy Salah. And uh, you can also send your meats and the goodies of the Salah to us. So Dr. Sefa and Dr. 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 final one before we close. Thank you very much. A very interesting meeting, and I have learned so much from it. Thank you, Dr. Seko, for showing all those slides and the multicolor to the game. So, Dr. Dr. Seko, your final words, sir. Well, I, I want to thank everybody, and I think that, um, you know, we are, we, we are going places as a country, and I think that even as the country is improving and things are happening and different issues are happening all over the place, there are still good things happening in the country that we can take advantage of for our patients to get the best for all of them. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining. The link for the slide and your uh, CME certificate will be sent to the email you use while registering. So we thank you very much. We have close to more than 150 people and uh, uh, joining us and close to one thing staying to the end of the presentation. We appreciate you. And very soon we'll be seeing the, the advert for the next webinar presentation. And if you have not joined our WhatsApp group, the link will also be sent to you. You can join any of the WhatsApp group where you can send your ECG. You can oh, discuss patients with us ahead before they get to us you can send any question you have and we'll try as much as possible to answer your question thank you very much have a wonderful weekend and enjoy your salad break god bless you we we'll see you during the next webinar thank you the link of the whatsapp group yeah. is in the chat box you can click on it and join the whatsapp group and then you can post your ecgs or any questions you have god bless you and see you next month thank you so much Thank you, Chief. Have a fruitful day. Yes, so my brother, thank you. Dr. Seko, thank you, sir. <laughs>